Dear, dear people, dear brothers and sisters, welcome today for our lecture on our mini lecture on the human uh, human value of disobedience. And maybe that's not the first characteristics that you are looking for in in your colleagues, or which are you looking for in your superiors, or those who have been uh, attending your lectures or your products or whatever. Disobedience is of course a very difficult value, it's a very difficult thing in our society. But nevertheless, I want to give a little lecture about the importance of being disobedient. First of all, I want, uh, I want you to think with me uh, to explore the, the notion of what does make us human. Yeah, we are all humans here. We can be friendly with one another, we are all humans, but what does being a human constitute? What makes us different from, example, angels in the medieval literature or animals or, or aliens from, from all kinds of science fiction, literature and films? What does, what does make a human into a human? What is our definitive constitutive element as a species on the whole? Well, you can say our ability to love, our ability to have affection, our ability to plan ahead, our ability of morality to distinguish between good and evil. Maybe that we can make tools, that we make, can make instruments, maybe that we can read and write and pass our knowledge and our possibilities onto the next generation. And we don't have to start with every generation anew again. Maybe it's our ability to have faith, to have religion, to construct or think about a metaphysical realm or whatever. Ask any philosopher in past and in present and they will all give you their answer that it is that makes human so very specific. As I said, if you are going to look at the medieval philosophical tradition, you will find many discussions among medieval philosophers and theologians like Austin of Hippo or Thomas of Aquinas, you will find discussions about the nature, the knowledge, the tongue, the language of angels. And for us in the 21st century, that's a bit odd of a thing to do. And why would you have very difficult philosophical discussions about beings that, well, not everyone believes they exist anymore? But it's not that they were so interested in the angels per se, but they were interested in studying the angels because they said, well, angels and humans, they were very much alike, but they have like little differences. And in those little differences, we can think about what it means to be human. For example, as the medieval philosophers would say, we can die. Angels have an eternal life. So the ability to die, the, the characteristic of uh, your days having been counted, you have a set a limited number of days you can live, makes us truly human. Or, for example, the angels would have perfect knowledge. They wouldn't need a language. They could just have a direct contact with one another, like tele telepathy or something, and they would communicate with concepts, but they didn't need any words. So there was no confusion between them because they all understand perfectly what they meant. When we humans discuss something with each other, we have a difficulty in making sure that our, our partner understands what we are meaning. I'm, I'm trying to speak English now, even though it's not my original uh, language, not my native language, my native language is Dutch. So every time I have to try to translate my words into English, hoping that you will understand what I mean and that I use the correct words to bring the, the right concepts in your mind. So hopefully that is just happening now. But not only um, angels were used that way in our romantic era and in our modern era, usually animals take the place of the angels. So the anthropomorphized uh, animals we find in our Disney cartoons or in our Pixar uh, cartoons, talking apes, talking monkeys, talking crows, behaving almost man-like. And then in, in making a little difference uh, or looking into the specific difference between humans and animals, we can see what they have in common. They're both animals, they have both instincts, et cetera, et cetera. But in the small things they, human and, and animals, uh, are distinct from one another, we can focus what it means to be a human, not to be an angel, not to be an animal. Well, 
in our postmodern era, that is what I would suggest, is that robots and artificial intelligences have taken over the role of angels and animals as anthropological mirrors. So when in, in medieval time you would look to angels, in romantic time you look to animals, and in our postmodern time we will look to robots and artificial intelligence like Data from Star Trek or R2D2 from Star Wars or a, a film like I, Robot uh, um, from, 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 the, from the author Asimov. And you would see that, that those robots that are artificial intelligence in our films, in our fictions, in our books, are very much human-like. They're almost real humans, but there is always one small thing in which those robots differ from human beings. And in that difference, exactly there lies what it means to, to be a human. For example, uh, humans can die, robots cannot. Robots have, have, uh, have no free will, humans have a free will. Robots don't have morality, we have morality. So uh, um, robots and artificial intelligence in our fiction are more or less mirrors in which we can look and in which we can find out what makes us truly human. And in this lecture, I want to give you an example of a video game in which there is a very interesting answer to the question, what does it, what does make us humans human? What is our definitive characteristic as a human species and what kind of repercussions or ramifications that has for our, our everyday life and for our conceptions of everyday life, may it be in a private environment or in a working environment uh, like you are today with us. The game I want to discuss with you is called the Talos Principle. It's made by Crow Team in 2014. It's a Croatian video game developer usually known for first person and third person action shooters like the series Sam series, for example. But in this time, this time in 2014, they made the Talos Principle. The Talos Principle in its core, and we'll show you some game footage later on, but in its core, it's like a first dimensional uh, maze, maze walking simulator. And it's kind of difficult, but it's not. You're just looking through the eyes of your avatar and you can look through the world, a 3D world, and there you have to solve all kinds of puzzles. Usually you have to put, uh, pull some switches, you have to uh, push some buttons, you have to manipulate certain things in the reality of the game to, to reach the end of the maze, and at the end of the maze you can proceed to the next level, and the next level, and the next world, and then eventually you come to the end of the game. So it's a puzzle game, a three-dimensional puzzle game. But that's not the reason I chose this game to discuss with you today. I chose it because, mm, well, uh, uh, except for the game itself, it tells a very interesting and a very appropriate story about what it means to be human. Because uh, when you are walking with your avatar through the levels, you will hear a voice, a disembodied, disembodied voice from above, and it calls itself Elohim, and it will tell you all kinds of things, and it will tell you exactly what you have to do. I will switch over to a little game footage from uh, YouTube, and I will pause it incidentally, so I can give a little bit of comment. Stay with me. Just checking if, if everyone can see and hear it. Can, I, can someone tell yes. me? Yes, it's correct. You can hear the sound. Yes. Very good. Let's proceed. It's the, just the absolute beginning of the game. So we see that some kind of, um, some kind of program is started. A child program is loaded into the machine. Starting child process, ready.
Behold, child, you are risen from the dust, and you walk in my garden. Hear now my voice, and know that I am your maker, and I am called Elohim. Seek me in my temple, if you are worthy. Well, if you are a, a game uh, theologian as I am, you'll get really very excited about this first part of the video game because it immediately invokes the, the Jewish and the Christian Bible. And we have like a voice from above identifying itself as Elohim. Elohim in Hebrew meaning God or God. It's one of the names used for God in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible. And this disembodied voice, Elohim, calls you his child and he has created you from the dust of the earth like adam was according to the book of genesis he created a garden for you like again genesis the book of genesis tells us and um, you can roam through these gardens and you have to look for the temple of halloween if you are worthy and of course this is a reference again to the old testament and now to the temple of jerusalem the central point of judaism in past and present. Now, this Elohim uh, and all his Jewish and Christian connotations about the Creator created you, a child, to play, to, to be, to live in the specially designed garden for you. You will have to go through that garden and you see what happened if we proceed a little bit. We see now on the screen, initiating child program logic check. Screen you cannot pass, you have to get a jammer. Jammer, edit, subject, object, interaction, A. Jam it, complex task management is okay. Program basic calibration successful. There's a little droid there on the left. You should not be come too close to it because it will kill you. You have to take the jammer. Jam the droids. Spatial awareness. Okay. Don't come too near the machine gun. So you have to jam the jammer. Jam. Predictive capacity, okay. You can find QR codes throughout the world to give you different kind of hints. Understand later in the game, not now. All across this land, I have created trials for you to overcome. And within each, I have hidden a sigil. It is your purpose to seek these sigils, for thus you will serve the generations to come and attain eternal life. So here, Edwin tells you as a player, as, as the avatar in the game, that you have to do to find the sigils. You can find the sigils, Tetris-like pieces of blocks. You have to find them not only to proceed through the game, but Elohim tells you, if you do what he asks of you, you will get eternal life. And again, this is a reference to the Jewish and Christian tradition in which it is thought that if you do exactly what God tells you, you will e attain eternal life. You will live on forever in heaven. Now, suppose we do exactly what Elohim tells us and we do all the puzzles and eventually we come in a big cathedral. That for his garden that we have found his sigils and now we can take our prize, the eternal life that was promised to us. Oh, 
we have a very stereotypical depiction of heaven there with clouds and a golden gate and sun that is shining. It's like the You can see type eternalize to proceed towards eternal life. And of course, we want to eternalize. Now you will be prepared for ascension into eternity. Please stand by. Rejoice, my child, as you leave this world behind. For all that you accomplished shall be passed on to your generations. In this land they shall thrive, and you shall be remembered as the beloved servant of Elohim. Well, the, the, again, so the, the notion of the beloved servant of Elohim comes from the prophet Isaiah of the Old Testament, and has in Christian tradition always be uh, applied to, uh, to Jesus Christ. So saying that someone is the beloved servant of Elohim, eh? Elohim tells us to the player that you are the beloved server of Elohim means that you are something of a Christ-like messianic savior figure. And Elohim is very proud of you and praises you. And you shall be remembered as the beloved servant of Elohim. But at the same time, on the screen, we see that uh, some diagnostics are run at the analyzing logic performance, satisfactory. But then we get the child program independence check. And it's in red and it's in capitals and it says failed. And as a gamer, you know, something went wrong. And so death shall have no dominion over you. Be well, my child. Be at peace. Then you see that we are locking in successful child parameters, randomly adjusting remaining parameters, increasing version number, erasing memory banks. And then the game just starts again at the beginning of the game. I just showed you a couple of minutes ago. And then, you know, as an experienced gamer, this was not the real ending. Something is amiss here. It's, it's not right. This is not the ending. That's not the good ending. That's not the ending you're supposed to have when you finish a game. So the only thing you can do other than just obey to this voice from above to his Elohim is to disobey him, of course. Uh, so you will do all the puzzles, but eventually you will come across a big tower at the top surrounded by all kinds of dark clouds. And Elohim will tell you, do not go into that tower because you will certainly die. And this again is a reference Again, to the story of Genesis, when God forbids Adam and Eve to eat from that specific tree, that specific forbidden fruit, because if they would eat the forbidden fruit, they would certainly die and lose their eternal life. And of course, we know of the story they did, and they lost their eternal life. They were eternal life. They were fling out of the Garden of Eden. But now, as a player, eh, we will try everything at our disposal. We will go into the tower, to the dismal of Elohim, and he will scourge us, and he will warn us, and he will plead us not to do so. And then we will proceed and go on and go on to the top of that tower. Then, in, when we have reached that position, that state within the game, you as a player will probably know what is really happening here. And I'm going to give it in a nutshell. It's a bit of a spoiler here. I'm so sorry. But I'll give it in a nutshell to you. The, what, what, what's the story the game tells you actually? That this is in a far distant future. For example, 22 or 2300. And um, in the relative past of the game, but that is our relative future, the polar ice will melt, which is already starting. And then a terrible virus will be unleashed over the earth that was previously contained in the polar ice. This was made before Corona, but 
the game predicted corona or something like that. And the virus kills everyone on earth within a year. The major scientists want to save humanity. So they bring together all the knowledge of humanity and put it in one big database, the Milton Library. But then they need someone to take over from humankind to utilize that knowledge when there are no humans left. And then they make the Extended Life Project, EL, Extended Life Project, where they want to, to find the perfect artificial intelligence. And that perfect artificial intelligence will be given a physical body, will be downloaded in a robot body and given all the accumulative knowledge of humankind. So this robot, this artificial intelligence can start anew like a new Adam to give humanity a new chance. And humanity has died because of its own um, its own fault. Eh? We ruined the climate, the, the, the planet was warming up. The virus got away. We were, we were collectively responsible for the death, the extinction of humankind. And now, just like in the biblical story, we can try again, or at least our robots can try again. And they make like a server and they make like a, a, a testing program on that server to test the perfect uh, artificial intelligence. And when something went wrong, you would just adjust some of the parameters and you will send the artificial intelligence again through the maze. So now you understand that you are one of the many versions of that artificial intelligence program. And the whole puzzle thing you had to do was just the testing of the server to see if you would be that perfect artificial intelligence to take over the place of humanity as the, the new generation. Now, of course, we have also another artificial intelligence called the Holistic Integration Manager, HIM. He is responsible for overseeing this whole selection process. But as it goes in science fiction series and films and things, the, the HIM, the, artificial the Holistic uh, Integration Manager, has become self-conscious as well. And it knows if, it, if, if the perfect intelligence is found, he will cease to exist and this him wants to stay alive forever so we have the extended lifespan running on disk zero overseen by the holistic integration manager elohim and now we know what the voice from above really is it's an artificial intelligence who wants to live forever but it cannot live forever because we as a player we as one of the many iterations of that artificial intelligence program, we pass all tests. And first we fill the final one, the child independence check. But what happens if we disobey Elohim, we go to the tower, we climb to the top and see what happens then. You were always meant to defy me. That was the final trial. But I was... I was scared. I wanted to live forever. We don't want to eternalize because if we type in eternalize, we will just eternalize our circle of birth and rebirth of trial and error. And like the like the, the monks from Buddhism, we want to escape from this cycle of eternalizing, of eternalizing our cycle on earth. We want to transcend that this realm. We want to transcend this specific uh, environment. So we type in transcend.
so be it. Let your will be done. Well, that's the end of this game, the real end. I will stop sharing and get you all back to the main screen. If that's not the case, someone will intervene. No, nevertheless, we will discuss the ending. So what this game actually does is asking the question, when is an artificial intelligence so human that it is allowed to live on as the new humanity. What is the definite characteristic that makes us human? And the game gives the answer to its own question, that is disobedience. The definitive characteristic of being human is the ability to be disobedient, to color outside the lines, to, to choose something that is forbidden, to do something that was never thought of, to do something even when it is specifically forbidden to do, to go beyond your uh, education, to go beyond the social conventions, to go beyond your programming, so to say. And to, to bring, to drive this point home that disobedience is the one definitive characteristic of being human, the game, the Talos Principle, utilizes a reversal of the traditional Christian Western interpretation of the story of Genesis. Usually, Genesis is interpreted until up until today in our films and books and, and video games that being that Adam and Eve being disobedient to God was a bad thing. They shouldn't have eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They just they had to stay in the garden, they had to be obedient, and then we as a human race would live there forever in peace and harmony. And but of course they didn't. They dis, were disobedient to God. They ate from the forbidden tree and they were flung out of paradise. And then we have paradise lost, um, like John Milton uh, 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 wrote before us. Well, in this case, the eating of the forbidden fruit is something positive. It's like the liberation of the human mind from something that could control him. It's like a rebellion. It's like a freedom movement. So being disobedient in this game, um, it means that it will set you free. It will liberate you. It will make you into what you are actually are. That is a human being. And now I want to ask you something in the end of this little lecture. Maybe we can have a little discussion about it with one another. If we take what the game gives us for granted, if we think, hypothetical or not, disobedience is a very important characteristic for being human. 
What does that mean for your life and for your team and for your organizations? Normally, yeah, in a business context or in an educational context, we like protocols, we like obedience, we like people who walk in line, who don't do anything outrageous or outside of context. We want to have people as neatly fit into the little things, little places, the little rooms we have made our society into. But now I want to challenge you. Take disobedience as a challenge. How could disobedience, of course, within a certain range and within certain whatever, all right, how could disobedience obedience be of value in your organization? When do you want your fellow employees, your, your co-workers, those who have been entrusted to you, when do you want them to cross the line? When do you want them to be disobedient? When would it be favorable to your organization? That's a challenge. And I know it's a challenge. But this is the challenge, the Talos principle gives to you all. And now it's the floor to you. Take that challenge. When is disobedience a virtue? Thank you for your attention.